the percentages of autoimmune disorders and psychiatric disorders and obesity and chronic disease and cancer and all of that skyrocketing, that's already a problem now. If it gets worse, that's gonna decimate the country. There are already countries in Europe that are healthier than us, like our life expectancy is going down. That's not great because mm -hmm. we've got all these new technologies, like why, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. Like just copy what the smarter people did by banning the ingredients we already know are causing problems. Coming from a more liberal background in Canada, it was shocking to me that that was hosted by Republicans because chronic yeah. disease isn't just hitting it's a bipartisan Republicans. Issue. It's, it's so interesting to see politics switch. Kennedy talks about this all the time. He's like, yeah, I didn't leave the Democrats, they left me. I know a number of people mostly in California, that are the voting Democrat, that are friends. And I'm like, how? I'm not able to vote. Their argument was you're in an echo chamber. But I can't be in that much of an echo chamber. Okay, as we roll in here, we're, we're talking about all this, all the political things going on. And I thought it was so cool that you did that huge Maha event. It felt almost like it was like the kickoff to Maha in a way, because so many of you went to Washington, D.C. and spoke in front of Congress, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So how did that come about? Okay, it, it was pretty random, actually. Uh, Kennedy was doing a podcast at my house that my parents are moving into. So it was in that house. And I know Callie Means, and I texted Callie and was like, you know, Kennedy's here, they're doing a podcast. They sent a picture of the podcast and he was like, oh, that's great. Hey, do you want to come speak at, you know, in Washington? Uh, and that was like next week, Monday. So mm -hmm. it was like four days away. I was like, yes, I definitely do. It, it was wild. Because your dad went too. Oh yeah, dad went too. Yeah. So he was like, do you want to come speak? I was like, yeah, I definitely want to come speak. He's like, does your dad want to come speak? I was like, oh, I don't know, Pro <laughs> like probably. I mean, who's going to say no to that opportunity? So yeah. How many of, I mean, there was 15 of you-ish? Something like yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, how did that feel? Was it, did it, was there a lot of people? Was there a lot of it press was, there? It was pretty, it was pretty organized. We had dinner the night before, <laughs> which was all seed oil free. Everybody had steaks and salad and everything was gluten free. It was like, this is not, this is kind of nice. People had fruit for dessert. They so came with it, their own salt. <laughs> I don't think anybody came with their own Ugh, salt. Rookies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> uh, so that was great. Uh, and then, I mean, Callie did a great job organizing it, actually. It kind of felt like being in Veep a little bit. Have you seen that TV show? No, but I feel like I'd be so much more interested in them now because I'm swirling in the political world. Yeah, you should give it a shot. I started watching Veep because I'm I am eventually going to get my green card and I was like, do I have to do some sort of test? Do I have to know how the government works? Maybe I can learn about it through Veep. Huh. Does it piss you off then that there are so many illegal immigrants if you have to go through so much effort to get your to get your is it a green card to be like citizenship? No. Working? Yeah, well I have a work visa right now. Right. So I'm on an L1A right now which was a pain to get. So I got married, I'm married to an American. And in that order- That didn't work? That wasn't the so be all end all? You, you can get it that way, but in order to do that, I would have had to spend almost a year stuck in the US not being able to travel while I waited for the visa, even after we got married. Huh. And I was like, what if I have to go? I had funerals and things. I was like, what if I have so to leave, leave the country? The country? Or no, and that you risk not being able to get back in when you don't have a visa, when you're just waiting for it. I was like, okay, well then why wouldn't I just get a, I can get a work visa at least. So that was a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, How long did that take? It was still annoying, like a lot of paperwork. I think it took... The holiday season is starting and it's easy to fall on routine this time of year. That's why I've relied on drinking AG1 for the past two years. I ditched my other supplements for AG1 and I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. AG1 especially helps me when I'm traveling and need an easy way to support my health. With added benefits of probiotics, prebiotics, and adaptogens, AG1 can help combat the stress of holiday schedules while helping your digestion and supporting your energy. What I love about AG1 is that they come in individual packs. I can take them on the go, which makes it so easy for not only my work, but the holiday travels I have coming up. I've noticed since I started taking AG1 that my gut health is so much better, my stomach is flatter, less bloated, and I can eat basically whatever I want. Before I go ahead and put coffee on top of it, 
I go ahead and use AG1 first. And right now, AG1 is running a special Black Friday offer for all of November. So this holiday season, try AG1 for yourself or gift it to someone special. It's the perfect time to focus on supporting your body with an easy and surprisingly delicious daily health drink. That's why I've been partnering with AG1 for so long. Every week of November, AG1 will be running a special Black Friday offer for a free gift with your first subscription. In addition to the welcome kit with vitamin D3 plus K2, make sure to check out drinkag1.com slash pretty intense to see what gift you can get this week. That's drinkag1.com slash pretty intense to start your holiday season off on a healthier note while supplies last. Let's see. I think I really started working at it in January and got it in August. That's still a while. It took a while. Yeah. I've, I also could have got an 01, which is the entertainment visa. That would have been a lot faster. That's like, I think that's the only visa I've heard of that can actually be turned around quickly and you have to be in a specific line of work to get it. I got an L1A, which is more like management work visa and mm -hmm. that was more annoying. It's mm -hmm. annoying. I get dragged into a back room every mm -hmm. time I go from Canada to the US. Like, what do you do? Who are you? Don't use your phone. Do you have like the four S's on your ticket? Remember, do you remember that thing that came with Tulsi Gabbard, how she spoke out against Kamala and then she all of a sudden got put on the quiet skies list, which oh there's my gosh. four S's I on have heard your about ticket this. then. Yeah, I, I actually had four S's on my tickets when I was much younger and I would always get pulled aside and I just, I thought it was on everyone's ticket. I thought, I made a joke. How I was do you like, find this? On your airline ticket? It literally is on your airline ticket and there's four S's. And I always joked, I'm like, oh, super, super, super security pass. And um, so I'd always get pulled aside. Now I know that, that I was on Quiet Skies. I don't know if it's because I lived in England when I was a kid or something like that or when I was 16 and 19, but... Um, but I, I, rem I, I, she gets, okay. I'm sure she get pu got pulled aside every single time just oh my like gosh. that. Okay, I need to. So do you check have four that. S's on your I back? don't know, but I, I don't know, but I always get pulled into a back room, yeah. and I don't know why. I think so. During COVID, I went from, I was trying to travel from Serbia to the U.S., and it was in COVID when there were travel restrictions from Europe, mm. and we had a stop in Amsterdam, and this is when they first got in place. So I didn't realize how insane everything was. I landed in Amsterdam and then went to the US and I got to the US border and they're like, you can't come in because you were in Amsterdam and you were in Europe. And I was like, well, I wasn't really, we like landed. Oh yeah, was I wasn't really there, but mm. I had a stamp. And so then I had this like denied from the US in my passport oh my for a gosh. while. So that didn't help any, like that caused a whole bunch of problems. I had to explain every time I crossed the border. No, I didn't like try to, and I tried to enter during COVID, things were confusing. Anyway, you're just supposed to go to the southern border and just go through the tunnel system yeah. that they have now. I mean, it would be a lot easier. Did you see that documentary um, that James O'Keefe put out oh, called? I, I was invited. To, did you go to that? I, I was invited know. to that. They had a big premiere thing. I haven't watched it. Do you like free stuff? Well, you're in luck because Buy Optimizer's Black Friday deal starts now, and they're giving away free gifts with purchase the entire month of November. This is their best sale of the whole year, so be sure to stock up. If you're feeling stressed out or haven't been sleeping well lately, you're not alone. You might not be able to change all the chaos out there, but you can start supplementing with one key ingredient to improve your sleep quality, as well as over 600 other biochemical reactions in your body. Magnesium Breakthrough is the only product I've found that has all the magnesium forms in one convenient bottle. You'll open less bottles, spend less money, and still get the top seven forms of magnesium for better sleep, managing stress, balancing hormones, improved mood, feeling fresh, all in one bottle. You get all seven critical forms of magnesium. Pretty much every function in your body gets upgraded. Right now, for the entire month of November, by Optimizers, the makers of Magnesium Breakthrough, are having a Black Friday blowout sale on all of their products. All month long, you'll get discounts with my unique code, plus access to up to $100 in free gifts with purchase. You can only get this exclusive deal through my link, special for my audience. You won't find this on Amazon or even the company website. Go to buyoptimizers.com slash pretty intense and use code pretty intense to get your discount and free gifts today. One last thing, you should know all Buy Optimizers supplements are best in class. If for some reason you feel differently, you can get a full refund up to one year after purchase, no questions asked. 
Again, the link to go to right now for this exclusive deal is buyoptimizers.com slash pretty intense using code pretty intense. James O'Keefe did this documentary on the border and he just, it was in insane to see how like borders either paid off or letting things through. There's like tunnels, they're cutting the wall. It's wild. It's wild. There's just buses taking people to cities, to sanctuary cities, I, I've asylum heard, cities. Yeah, it's nuts. It's like, nuts. Like, why do we have why do we have cities? I think California is in a, a sanctuary state now. Why do we have? I mean, like, why would we have cities that it's okay as an illegal immigrant to be able to go? Like, you're just talking to me about how difficult it is and how you're stopped at the airport and. Like, you're doing everything as legit as you possibly can and not doing anything wrong, and you have to go through the hassle where yeah. these people that are, are, are just absor being absorbed into our system with our taxpayer money are now given money for food, places to live, no questions asked. That's what I happens. I used to think it was, like, compassion. You know, this was 10 years ago probably when I was like, okay, people are trying to leave their country having a very difficult time and they finally escape that and get to come to America. So the government, I don't know if I fully believe this, but I was like, it's understandable that the government would help out some of these families that like escape from something horrible. But then you see what's actually going on, which isn't that. And it does look like there's something more like nefarious going on about why they're allowing all these people through illegally. And, then, and then part, so part of it is probably, I don't know if it has something to do with voting, like we could, we could get into that. You mean the fact that Gavin Newsom, or as um, Trump likes to call him, Newscum, <laughs> 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 banned voter ID in California? Oh banned. my gosh. I, I just don't understand why you can vote for a country when you're not a citizen of the country. It's so wild. Like, are are there it. not? Also, I don't know enough about U.S. politics, but are there not laws in I'm place about too. how to monitor that? Because you'd think in countries showing ID is not discriminatory. Like well, you just even, you show ID, yeah, and then you vote. I was like, do you think I'd be? I have an Arizona license now. I'm here on a work visa, so I don't actually, I can't actually vote because I'm Canadian. I was like, if I went in with an Arizona license, do they check? I'm I not going to do it I because mean, it's it, a felony. But like, I think you could like, probably just go to California and just go vote. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I don't, I mean, it seems ludicrous. It seems, but I, I think there are, I think that's what that means. I think, yeah. There's no common sense to that. No, no, no. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, that should be the least you need to vote. Wait. ID, vote on paper. It's not that complicated. And then for immigration, like, if there was any type of way to, if there was any way of testing people, which there are ways to test people to see who should be coming into your country, they should be able to see, like they kind of, for work visas, they look at how much you're making, how long you've been in business. And so there, but there are, there are ways to like check how useful basically the immigrant is, but it's not very well done. Okay. Like you could do some sort of psychometric testing and get like high IQ people, young people. You could do that as a government. It wouldn't be that difficult to implement. Hmm. But instead, like we had, we brought somebody in, he's from Argentina, he's one of my assistants, great guy, really smart, but because he didn't have like certain things, he hadn't finished his university degree, which really wasn't relevant to how useful he is, then getting him into America took like years, right? <laughs> and then I've had other people, or like people that have worked for us from the UK or something that get a visa really easily because they have a university degree. They're completely useless. It's just you'd think that there'd be a way to test people who are coming into your country because it's not like all immigration is bad. Rampant immigration from who knows what kind of people that are just pouring in mm -hmm. and won't assimilate to the culture, that's a huge problem. Right. But like trying to grow, you know, America with useful people, that could be done in such a more sophisticated yeah. way. The United States is not against people living in our country. No. Like, I mean, it's not overpopulated. All you have to do is get in an airplane. There's plenty of space out here. But it should be, like you said, people that can assimilate, assimilate to the culture and not, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't even know. I think that was part of, remember when they're like, they're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats thing? I think some of that might have had to do with like satanic ritual, or rituals, let's just call it rituals, <laughs> with like sacrificing animals, might have even been part of it. And so anyway, assimilate to the culture and be productive and be helpful 
and contribute and not just live off of the government paychecks and have things paid for. I, I think it's a wild problem. I think mm. in one of the, um, when I sat down with J.D. Vance in North Carolina, I was asking for some statistics, but they think that Ill illegal immigration costs the country about $150 billion a year. Yeah, that's crazy. And yet, like, natural disasters happen and there's not enough money to give people to like, get, their get their feet back on the ground. Do you think that hurricane fiasco is what, because I, I feel like when, when Kamala first kind of came out that she was running and everything, I was su surprised, but it looked like she went up. Like it looked like she went above Trump for a while there. Mm -hmm. And now it looks like it's reversed. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of that was her response to the hurricane or the, the current you know government's response to the hurricane, which yeah, was a disaster? I, th I think that based on her reaction or lack of reaction, I think the the timing and the optics of her going on like call me daddy and the view and doing that stuff all during the during that time i know that was one of the big accusations like you went on call me daddy instead of being in north carolina with people that were struggling and running that running that um, program yeah. to make sure they got help it took fema like six days to like be dispatched and another two before they got boots on the ground it was wild and they stopped elon from being able to help right he, i mean <laughs> so he's just going to local people that like one of them was a race car driver greg biffle hell it has a helicopter and he was like bringing in supplies and starling for people and i think that her choices in interviews that she's done have have not shed good light on her and I don't know if it's even possible because the shows she's done have been so softball and they're not usually long format. And if they are, they're very programmed. I mean, I'm, Call Me Daddy is not exactly a, a hard hitting interview, nor is The View. But I think the things that she's done have just been, have just not really made her, it's shown how little she knows about her policies and how unable to be nimble on her feet she is and even have her own ideas. Yeah. I don't know, what do you think? What have you seen? I mean. That's what it's looked like to me is it just it's just finally showing that she's not really qualified for the job. Yeah, I think it's that. I mean, anything long form, even the Call Her Daddy interview was, I think it was an hour. I think maybe the long form stuff just isn't doing her well. Because, I'd love to see her on, know. I'd love to see her on Rogan. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I know. There's no way. Oh, both of them. Not that at would the same be great. Time. It would be great to just three like, hours with each of them. Let them speak. Yeah, not at the same time. Let them each speak for three hours. That's such a good way of judging, some like judging somebody, judging anybody, because you're not gonna. It's hard to keep up some sort of facade for three and a half hours That's or right. however long. Yeah. That's right. Around Joe too. I mean, and he's because he's so smart. He's. I mean, he's done. 2,000 interviews by now. Yeah. And he's talked to everyone. I mean, this is the beauty of podcasts. I mean, you have your own too. Like, this is such a cool time in our country or mm -hmm. in the world for information. It, it's fantastic. I know. Dad's podcast with Kennedy was really good. That was fascinating. I was like, this is so cool. It's like history in the living room. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, isn't Bobby so brilliant? I mean, his answers are very long. Yeah. But there's so much information in them. He's also, he doesn't come across as a politician, which is right. nice. He's just a person, right? I've met, like, and when you meet, I haven't met J.D. Vance, so I don't know J.D. Vance, but I've met a lot of other politicians. And so, you know, sometimes there's a, even if I like them, sometimes there's a persona kind of like mm -hmm. working with an agent from CAA. And I, I like my <laughs> agent from CAA, uh -huh. but like, there's like some salesy stuff going on sure. and you get that with politicians all the time and with like actors and just certain people. But I feel like with Kennedy, you don't get that at all. I've found that a lot on the Republican side or the conservative side, whether it's Tucker. Have you met Tucker yet? Mm -hmm. He's even better in person. He's even more like cool. He's very locked in. He's very curious. He's friendly. Very friendly. Bobby, I mean, I've been skiing with Bobby and like hanging out with Bobby. Yeah. Like, super normal guy like when when i say skiing it was um in aspen over new year's and we just were up in like the top of the gondola ski lounge having lunch and he's just in the regular area with everyone just hanging out people come up to him he talks to him they go people come up to him talk to him they go he's at the table like yeah. i mean that's just like he there's no um it's like no famous sort of like special accommodations it's just he's just doing it and with jd he didn't 
I didn't meet him until 10 minutes before we went on stage. And normally, like, especially if I'm moderating, like, I've only done it a couple times, but I'd like to just say, like, do you want me to ask you about this? Or yeah. if, I, if you have the choice, do you want me to ask you this or do you want me to ask you this? Is this yeah. something that would help or that you'd want to talk about? And didn't do any of that. And I was like, all, all we did was chit chat about his kids and going to the racetrack oh, that weekend. Cool. And his wife, uh, Usho, was there. And so the three of us just stood there and talked and waited. And then I didn't even hear my name get called to have to go on stage. I'm like, did they just, yeah, they're like, go. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I was like, so formal, but so informal. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah. But how, I think, did, how did you get invited into doing that? Well, Tulsi invited me to do Bobby and Tulsi, to, in, to moderate for Bobby and Tulsi for a Reclaim America tour in Vegas. She just texted me, I mean, because I had interviewed her here at the studio. Ah, uh -huh. okay, okay. Yeah, and then so we had, we had each other's information, and so we had been a little bit in touch, and she's like, she's a cool girl, and she loves working out, and she loves, so we had kind of just kept in touch, and then she just asked if, I'd be, if I would be willing to moderate for them, and I was like, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's and, so cool. Yeah, yeah. Would you want to do that? Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, it's hard. You can't say no to opportunities like that. Mm -hmm. That would no, you that's ask? very cool. Oh, uh, what would I want to ask? You know what? <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't be good at moderating these people. What questions do I? I'd, I'd have to think about it honestly. I think I'm like fairly familiar with Trump's policies and very familiar with Kennedy's policies and what they want to push forward. Yeah. So I'd probably have to think. Yeah. You know what? I mean, what's the average kind of Democrat? thinking that isn't true about these people and ask questions about that. Yeah. Is that what you're trying to do? Is like address things that maybe people have the wrong, a misconception about? Yeah, exactly. And just explain what they're actually trying to do with certain things, Yeah, what their vision is, like what they, what they think is possible, how quickly they could accomplish it. Yeah, um, counteract some of the things that the Democrats are putting out about them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there have been a bunch of statements about Trump's views on abortion that are just not his views on abortion that are going around. Oh, yeah. So that's probably something that could be covered. Yeah. Stuff like that. But I'm learning too. I mean, politics is something pretty new for me. Is it new for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm Canadian. Exactly. What's the big difference between Canadian politics and American politics? Just well, I mean, the entire structure is different. Okay. I feel like the structure in Canada is pretty simple. There's like a prime minister, there's two sides. They're like it, in America, and I'm gonna sound like an absolute moron, but I am Canadian, so let's take that in. But there's, you know, three separate kind of areas of government that you have to remember. Right. And I was, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm slowly getting it. I'm slowly getting it, but it's, it's I'm, way I'm more you. complicated than it is in Canada or in the UK. You okay. Have a queen, you have a queen in the UK, but or a king. But. So you elect your prime minister, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's some of a somewhat of there's a democracy. Yeah, kind for, of. You know, to. Well. Or I don't it, know if I'd call it a democracy with true. Do you know what just happened? What? Okay, Trudeau. This is so aggravating. <laughs> Trudeau, while he was testifying, to I want to call it the Foreign Interference Committee in Ottawa, said that my dad was being paid by Russians. And we can't sue him <laughs> because you're immune as a member of parliament if you're testifying. Oh, just like, you mean like Big Pharma is with vaccines? Yeah, <laughs> then, no, 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 same thing. So it was like, you, you want to say that outside of testifying? Because then like it's, it's- Fair game. Fair game, yeah. It's like, that's great. Wow. Yeah, so now people online are up in arms and be like, oh, sue him. I'm like, yeah, we can't, he's immune. Well, Isn't that crazy? I mean, I was like, I, how can you be comfortable running a company lying you can't i it's just it's mind-boggling who, so, who, so what would their angle be why would they say that they said as we've seen uh as we've seen conservatives in canada they were trying to l link it to the trucker rallies as we've seen conservatives in canada are being funded by like the russian government like jordan peterson and tucker carlson which like i mean i know my dad and i know how we make money, so that's not true. I assume <laughs> you're Tucker's like, not you're like funded literally, by Russians. I'm doing the books over here, so. <laughs> so you've, you've been running his companies for yeah. years and years. Yeah. I mean. It's crazy to have that pop up in the news, though. It, As yeah. we've seen, this is happening. It's like, oh, we could sue him for that. That's defamation. Oh, we can't. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, it just is kind of hypocritical based on the fact that I feel like the left is the one that wants to have censorship and stop 
misinformation to be tra to travel around the country or the world because of social media and your ability to post something. Yeah. But then, you know, it's okay for someone like that to make bold accusations. It's hypocritical. Yeah, yeah, it's very hypocritical. Wild. I'll probably make a response video about that, maybe. Does your dad end up making response videos about that kind of stuff? Does it piss think, him off or does it really affect him? Or? You know what, there's been so many, <laughs> there have been so many things that he has, he has so much going on that he, I, he, like, we both looked into if we could actually pursue it legally. Mm -hmm. And then the lawyers were like, no. Like, well, could we send a letter or something demanding, you know, some sort of something? It makes sense. If you're not abusing the immunity, it makes sense. Members of parliament need immunity while they're testifying so they have freedom to speak and debate. And they don't have to feel like if they make a mistake, they could end up in jail or, or, or fined or something like that. Right. So that's where it originated. But that's before, you know, you have the leader of Canada just lying. But I guess it was a tactic used by Democrats here as well, right? With like Trump is funded by Russians. That oh, was yeah, like, that, that was, was the whole Russia, thing. Russia, so it's Russia like, thing yeah. that ended up being all a like lie. Like hiding Biden's laptop type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess it's, you know, par for the course. Politics, <laughs> wild. It's wild. I feel like the Maha part though, I and mean, that's my passion, the health, yeah. the health side of things. Like I got pissed off last December when I posted about going to AmFest and people were like, thought I was wildly radical, right, MAGA, whatever. MAGA is supposed to be mean, I think. Um, <laughs> and so I just got pissed off because I just thought that it was crazy that I can't say I love this country. I feel like everyone that lives in America should be able to say I love this country or not be offended. Like, if you're offended, you can go. It's totally fine. I've got a couple friends that are expats. No problem. But it's that the health sense. stuff that motivates me to get changed. Like, yeah, stop yeah, poisoning yeah, our too. food. Stop poisoning the air that we breathe. Um, me too. Change regulations so that food is has higher integrity. Like, we shouldn't go to Europe and feel like I need to get a vacation from American food by going to Europe. Yeah. You know? And, I, like, the nice thing about going to the like Maha event in Washington was, I think everybody who spoke there was aware that that's the biggest danger to Americans, to all Americans right now, which is how I feel. Like coming from someone who was chronically ill is, yeah. you know, the percentages of autoimmune disorders and psychiatric disorders and obesity and chronic disease and cancer and all of that skyrocketing, that's what's going to be, that's already a problem now. If it gets worse, that's gonna decimate the country. Like it needs to be dealt with now. And the argument that we made, mine was, mine was more niche, which was like, let's do some proper research. But the argument that the rest of the folks there were making was there are already countries in Europe that are healthier than us, like our life expectancy is going down. Mm -hmm. That's not great because mm -hmm. we've got all these new technologies. Like why, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. It was like, let's just copy what other people are done by banning the ingredients we already know are causing problems. Mm -hmm. Like just copy what the smarter people did, yeah. right? Um, it was shocking to me that that was hosted, probably coming from a more liberal background in Canada, it was shocking to me that that was hosted by Republicans. It was like, first of all, right. everybody should be interested in that because chronic yeah. disease isn't just hitting it's a bipartisan Republicans. Issue. It's a bipartisan issue. But it's just, it's so interesting to see politics switch oh, yeah. from like, and, and Kennedy talks about this all the time. Is like, yeah, I didn't leave the Democrats. They left me. That's right. Which is, it's true. He still has the same beliefs. He's still working yeah. on the same stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. And he I think- He doesn't fit in the party anymore. I know, I know a number of people, mostly in California, that are voting Democrat, that are friends. And I'm like, how, you know, how? I'm not able to vote. But are you not seeing what I'm seeing? And they're like, their argument was, you're in an echo chamber. I was like, okay, but I can't be in that much of an echo chamber. Like, I am searching. Can I find anything, like, halfway as intelligent that Kamala has said? Because I'm pretty sure they're trying to push that on the internet, right? And I can't find trying it. Trying to do their best to show yeah, you that. Yeah, exactly. And I can't find it. So I'm not... But Her these are smart are clips people, from the Democratic too. Party. The, the, the clips that come out are like, I don't know what... What did you just say? 
Like, that's not becoming of you. And that's literally produced by that side of yeah. the argument. Yeah, the, and then what was the, the TV aisle. station recently? Was it CBS or it was something like that that doctored one of the speeches? Oh. It was a, it was like a 60-minute interview, and they cut a whole bunch of sections and doctored it. So the original thing that went out wasn't what they put online. I mean, I don't know if you noticed when they did the presidential debate. Um, I mean, that's the only time that Kamala's looked good. Like, mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. just, well-spoken. Now, while I was watching it, I could tell she was lying. I was like, wait, hang on. That's not what, that's not what you've been saying. Like, she straight up lied a whole, like, many times during that. She did, though, present much better. Yeah, yeah. But there was one thing that I that's thought was ironic. That's boosted her. What, what one thing that think? I noticed is that Trump spoke to the moderators, and Kamala spoke to the camera. Did you notice oh, that? Oh, yeah. She literally spoke to the camera the entire time, and then they took all of that content, because I think it was admitted or somebody said that they worked with the Democratic Party on the questions before. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. The debate. And obviously they fact-checked him and not her many, many times mm -hmm. throughout the debate, but then they used a whole, it looks like clips from that debate that they used in their commercials. It was almost like this was sort of like a prepackaged thing where it was like, all right, this is going to create our content. Oh. We're going to get you so ready for this. We're going to, because she like looked down the barrel for every answer, which I, I was like, I don't know, as someone on TV, you, maybe that's why you noticed too. It was probably planned. Like you noticed, yeah. you noticed little things like that that are weird. I mean, finding content where she sounds like she's, I love when she's like, my policies, just look them up on my website. I'm like, <laughs> why why do an interview what do you hope changes as far as because with the maha stuff it's totally bipartisan i think that no matter what i feel like that movement isn't going away i mean if you had to name like a couple things that you would hope would change within the next few years what do you think would make the biggest difference to i mean ending i mean chronic disease and childhood I, disease that's on the huge upswing i actually think what would be more effective than banning the ingredients we use here that they use in Europe, which I'm all for, sorry, that they use here and don't use in Europe. Like mm -hmm. those should be banned. But I think what would be more effective is at least educating people that these processed, these highly processed foods are actually causing disease. Like they're not just bad for you. When I grew up, it was like, okay, I'd be fruit roll-ups and like Dunkaroos and things. Sure. Ho-hos, ding-dongs. Yeah. Great. Apple right? pies. Yeah. You know, you name it, out of the package. And we knew that was junk food. But I didn't know, like, I had an autoimmune disease and it was causing that, right? That's a different thing. So I feel like if people were educated on the actual dangers of seriously processed food and if the food pyramid was redesigned, like, I think if they just redesigned the food pyramid and were like, yeah, eat meat, you know, eat animal products, eat whole foods, you know, turn it upside down, basically. I think that just educating people on the dangers and fixing the food pyramid so it wasn't just designed by food corporations, that would do a lot for people. Because I don't think people would choose to eat stuff constantly or feed their like babies and kids these foods if they actually knew how dangerous they were. But the dangers are, are like downplayed by the food industry. They put out studies saying, yeah, they're, you know, they're not dangerous. I don't remember, I think it was Casey Means listed some statistic in her talk that was like, th this is, these are ballparks, but it was something like 90% of the studies that are put out by the food industry claim that these foods are fine, and 90% of the studies funded outside of the food industry claim that they cause disease. Where's the discrepancy? Like, how is that possible? So that's what I would do, is I'd just educate people and redesign the food pyramid. Yeah. And then banning these, you know, like, there, um, there's, people are after Kellogg's right now, and I'm all for that, like, but the Fruit Loops that they made in Canada, that were flavored with fruit juice. Yeah, did you try still them? Still killed me. Like I like I still I mean it was still a problem. I mean, now you it's mean seven worse to eleven here. servings of grains a day is not the great Yeah, diet? just like I mean just telling people don't do that I think would make a huge difference. Just people yeah. not eating as many carbs. Yeah. It's not super complicated. When I talk to people about food and whether it's vegan or vegetables or whatever, I'm like, look, there's only one food you can live off of for your entire life. And that's steak. Yeah. And I was like, my friend Michaela <laughs> only eats steak. And I've seen it. I've watched it. <laughs> like, she eats steak and only steak. And she's doing just fine. So, yeah. thriving, in fact. And so, it's just wild that it could look like it does. I mean, mm -hmm. just the corporate, corporate corruption 
uh, is so detrimental. Oh, and to, it's to so much worse. buy their way into the studies looking like yeah. they do. Being able to provide them themselves, yeah. which is wild. Well, um, and the fact that you can hire people in the food industry to like work for the FDA directly, like those people just switch jobs if you look at career progression. And so, I did, <laughs> the one thing I learned when I went to Washington was all the conspiracies I thought, they're, they're way worse than I thought. And it's all true. It was just, like. it was crazy. Well, I, like, I didn't realize that there weren't laws in place so that people who ran food industry, like major food corporations, they can just switch and work at the FDA. So all those people are friends. They shouldn't be friends if you're trying Did to Callie monitor. Did Callie tell you that? Because Callie was oh, a, Callie's Callie really, was like Callie's a really lobbyist for, for like yeah, a yeah. food company so I, lobbyist. I learned a bunch of that from him. I also didn't know that he said this at the, his Maha speech too, that a huge number of the people who are running big tobacco were hired to make foods more palatable. Oh, yeah. So they, they were like top scientists working with pig, big tobacco. And then as soon as the government finally cracked down on big tobacco, and that was partially through education being like, hey, these, you know, these can cause lung cancer. And once people started to know about that, they're like, okay, maybe I shouldn't smoke as much at least, like, which is what we have to do with junk food. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize that they just switched jobs and went into like cereal. Imagine if there was like a <laughs> black box kind of warning on unhealthy food, like may cause cancer. Yeah. Can you imagine if like a kid goes and grabs it's like, you know, um, candy, food, fruit roll-ups or whatever it was, and there's like a logo that says may cause cancer. Yeah. You know, like in, uh, I think in Europe, they put that on cigarette packs. It's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what you'll look like if you smoke these. Do they not have that here? They have that in Canada too. I don't think so. Oh my gosh, they've got like horrifying pictures of lung cancer. Yeah, and, like, exactly. Imagine if they put that stuff on, or they put like really obese children pictures of it, like may yeah. cause obesity. Yeah. And I don't even think that's dramatic because like being sick is so hard and it's not just hard for the person who's sick. It's incredibly hard for the person who's sick, but there are people taking care of that person. Their mood is completely unstable. They're exhausted all the time. It like ruins relationships and friendships. Like you can't thrive and be chronically ill and you can't be chronically ill and take medication and thrive. Like I was there, I was chronically ill. I was like medicated up the gills on this cocktail where I could actually somewhat function but compared to being healthy, I'm an entirely different person. And like, what percentage of America is like that? Like, at least it's like one in five have an autoimmune disorder. And then what percentage are on psych meds? It's something like 20%. It's huge. Is on that SSRIs? Psych meds. No. Those, that's that... uh, antipsychotics, SSRIs, benzodiazepines. Huge number of old women are on benzodiazepines because they hand them out like candy at that point. Wow. Those are almost, those actually, one of them at least, clonazepam has a black box warning now because you can't get off of it. It's impossible to get off of. They're so addictive. And not addictive like you want more, but your brain adapts. Thankfully, in the last couple of years, there's been cool movies, films, and like series that have come out, like Painkiller, I think was one of them. I'm trying to remember what their names, but they've been on Netflix and different platforms where it shows these drug companies and what the opiate sort of like epidemic, what it did to people and the corruption behind the scenes. And you talk about like people that basically work on both sides with um, food is that like on the drugs, to, drug administration too, like getting things cleared in the FDA, they just like in one of the movies, they just, one of the companies, the drug companies, just hired someone from them, brought them over to their company, like got them to pass the law, and then and great, I'll, like got them to clear the drugs, and then hired them on over. Like, it's yeah. just so There's much. There's so much fraud. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least I think people are cluing into it. And I do hope, regardless of what happens with the election, I do hope that the, the health ep epidemic isn't like, shunted like some right-wing conspiracy like i've seen articles come out that they're like oh kids aren't chronically ill it's like what you know because the republicans pick this up as an issue you're going to say that ki like obesity rates aren't rising oh my gosh it's so infuriating i watched a study or i just read something it was in the wall street journal i think or or, or it was i read it in a newspaper i'm starting to read newspapers now <laughs> it's been a while um maybe ever to be honest <laughs> i think i only read usa today back in the day um and i probably just looked at the picture uh but it was basically about um telephones and anxiety like social media and anxiety with kids 
and how even in this article, it basically was saying that there isn't really, it's not really clear that social media is creating anxiety in kids. And I'm like, wow, this is so wild. Because I was talking to my sister, because my sister has four kids. And we were talking about the two oldest. One of them kind of gets scared to do things and has some like anxiety about it. And then the other one, she's like, well, but she is, she gets anxious about everything. And I'm like, man, I wonder if kids today, it seems like anyone under 25, it seems like their nervous systems are hardwired different. Do you notice that? Yeah, I think it's probably a mix. Like my go-to is always to blame diet. Sure. And it like always. And it's kind of well, because gut health is the gut and the brain are connected. Yeah, so. and it, it made such a huge difference for me. Like I went, my my dad has this personality test where it gives you your five aspects. I went I from ninety ninth percentile in in uh, volatility. Huh. 99th, this is when I was on psych meds. And I, I rem like, I was so angry. And it turned out this was partially a side effect from the psych meds that like, you know, made me irate. But I went from 99th to sixth when I got healthy, which is like, I'm not very flappable now. I'm like, yeah. like really not very flappable. Wow. I was like, that feels better. Like I was in, in this unnatural state. I so, and that was diet for me, you know, as opposed to like, screen time or social media, but I didn't grow up with screens. My mom wouldn't even let me watch anything other than The Simpsons. Oh, wow. Yeah. My dad was like, she can at least watch The Simpsons. That was always a lot to watch as a kid. Which is telling you the future. <laughs> Have you seen how many yeah, times yeah. The Simpsons literally like foreshadows yeah. years ago things that are happening now? Exact dates, scenarios, people like depicts the whole thing. It's wild. I'm <laughs> it's pretty weird. Your, was your dad a psychiatrist and able to um, psychologist. prescribe? Psychologist. Um, cause I was wondering what he would like, how he would feel about all of the different meds that you were on just being so in that profession he was where they'd on, be. So psychologist, he couldn't prescribe medications. Right. He, he just did like clinical work and right. like, ways to therapy basically okay. like, yeah. you know, Talk therapy yeah. yeah. What were his thoughts? I mean, I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis in grade two and it took a number of years to get diagnosed because no kids had arthritis. So nobody knew what was going on. Um, and then I, I was having trouble walking. So it was like, what are you going to do for a kid that has trouble walking? So that I was immediately, you know, pretty quickly put on medication for that. And then in grade six, I was diagnosed with severe depression. And at that point, my dad was also severely depressed. Like he, the part of the reason he stopped working at Harvard was because his depression got so bad that he was like, I, I'm having trouble lecturing. Oh, wow. Right. And he had other autoimmune things going on at the same time, but it's just, nobody really knew what it was. So he was on antidepressants. I went on antidepressants. So he had not, like, we had no reason to think. We just thought what we were told, yeah. which was you have a serotonin problem. You don't produce enough serotonin. We thought it was a genetic thing that ran in our family because my great grandpa was really depressed. My grandpa was really depressed, my dad, me. And it was like, you have a genetic, problem producing serotonin, here's sure. a serotonin pill. Sure. Basically a serotonin reuptake, you know, Probably inhibitor. almost felt like a little bit of like a vitamin on, in some sense. Yeah, yeah, but like it did. But basically like, that, like psychologically, add what you didn't have. Yeah, and that's, that's all it was. Um, that's all it felt like. Anyway, that was not true at all. And they, it turns out that entire thing isn't true. You know, people don't have that as a, that's not even a problem, right? Like that's not why people are depressed. Imagine if doctors didn't get paid to prescribe drugs. Yeah. I wonder what that would do. When you watch those, I mean, the even older documentaries, or not documentaries, movies that showed, um, I'm trying to think how far back that was. It was the one with Anne Hathaway, Jake Gyllenhaal maybe? And it was where he was like, pushing, I think he was, I think he was. Oh, I just watched that. I can't remember what it's called. Kind of old. Yeah, yeah. But there's that one. I feel like there's been some other ones. But it just shows how how incentivized these these drug companies are I mean, to get it in with the doctors, and then the doctors get paid. I mean, it did the same thing even with the opioid stuff. Yeah, was that they wanted them to titrate up in their in their dosages because they would the doctors would make more money to titrate up. Like they got paid on the on the milligrams essentially. Yeah, that's crazy. So like that obviously shouldn't be allowed. Rule. That's also not allowed in most countries. <laughs> so like that's another thing. Just like American. there are other countries that just don't do that. So that's a problem. I think there's like 
a subset of doctors that are persuaded by money. But I think there are also a sub, like a good portion of doctors that actually get into the field trying to help people and are taught the wrong thing in medical school. And then I find that people who go to med medical school, and I have friends that are doctors that I really like, very open-minded, like great people. Mm -hmm. But I find, like getting a university degree, sometimes when you go through the process of, I have my university degree, I got into medical school, which was really hard, I finished medical school, you know, then I did my residency, I know so much. And there's this like narcissism that goes along with that, that when they reach patients, they go, hey, you know, this isn't really working for me. They're like, oh, you, you don't know what you're talking about. That's why you're sitting there and I'm sitting here. And so I think you get brainwashed going through medical school and then you don't, you're not open to like, hey, diet's causing my arthritis. And it's like, okay, little girl, I went, I, I've been doing this for 30 years. I would know if diet is causing arthritis. So that's a problem. And then, like I said, I think there's a subset of people that are just taught the wrong things. Um, I feel like if education changed in medical schools, it would be addressed. Because there are also doctors coming out being like Chris Palmer, being like, yeah, we should do research into ketogenic diets. It seems to be working for mental disorders, like schizophrenia, which you can't treat, right? So, like, what har what's mm -hmm. the harm of doing a keto diet? Right, right. Or even just... Another angle with psychological stuff and trauma, um, psilocybin, MDMA. Yeah. At least there are, it's funny, it's like, <laughs> so California came out, they banned, I can't remember what company it was, it was like Skittles or something, like they got rid of food dye for some product, and I was like, okay, so it's California that does that, but it's also California that has the crazy politics, but then it's <laughs> right. the Republicans that are, are doing Maha, it was like, the world is so crazy right now. Like if the doctors didn't get so incentivized yeah. to, to prescribe drugs and... I think it would be a different world that we they that do. we live in. in in countries where they're not incentivized, the average dosing of the drug is like ten percent of what they do oh, here. Oh wow! Yeah, so that does work. Wow. Yeah, and there's but there's more of a stigma. Like I think also what happened is society got so chronically ill. Say like in the '90s when thing you know things started shooting up in the mm -hmm. '80s, but like in the '90s when they're like, oh, a lot of people are depressed. Mm, oh, yeah, exactly. don't like there shouldn't be a stigma under around being like being depressed which is fair, it was fair in the 90s, which is like, if someone's depressed, it's not because they're like lazy, you know, there's actually something going on and those people deserve treatment. It was kind of like, it was kind of like the fat movement, but it was also reasonable because if you're extremely depressed, it's not because you're lazy, like there's something metabolic yeah. going on. Yeah. And then they found, you know, these SSRIs and things were like, okay, these people deserve treatment. And there was just too much of a move yeah. in that direction when people should have been looking at, wait, why suddenly is everyone depressed? And I think originally they thought, well, we just didn't know how to identify it before, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of this auto, even with the autoimmunity, I've heard, oh, well, we just couldn't identify it as early before. And now we're better at identifying it. That's why the numbers are going up, hmm. which isn't like, that's not what's going on. It just didn't exist. Before, before we had this, before, like, yeah, the exactly. food pyramid, the original food pyramid, or the mm. current food pyramid and everything like that. We were talking about school, and we were talking about what they learned in school. And, I mean, I know that doctors barely get taught about nutrition. Yeah, they, yeah, they don't. Um, but, you know, also, just to sort of, like, add in something that you've been working on for a while now, and which I think is so cool, but just, like, the curriculum in school and how expensive school is, and also statistics I've been hearing, um, and maybe the reason why you said like 10 years ago or in the past, like being in a more like liberal environment, is that something like 99% of professors oh, are democratic. Yeah. Which, you know, when we're looking at children, I was talking to someone the other day that um, has two sons and one went to college and one didn't. And the one that went to college is very liberal and the other one isn't. And I was like, wow, that's such a great, like, yeah. you know, uh, example of what school can do. So I, I just mentioning all this because it fires me up. I don't even have kids, but I did, I didn't, and I didn't go all the way through school, but look where I got to without college even and just getting a GED. All I've done is dive into all of my curiosities to raise my, you know, my level of intellect and base of knowledge um but the peterson academy is so cool i love i love that and i hope that you guys end up getting um to get make it college credits 
end up getting degrees out of it. But you know, I, back to what what they're getting taught in school, I wonder if it's just too skewed. And like part of the danger of going to college right now is that the information being taught and the way it's being taught or the values sort of wrapped around it by the individuals are just, it's one-sided. It, it's extremely one-sided. So like there's ideology baked into the entire curriculum. And it, sciences used to be safe and like math was safe. And then slowly it started infiltrating there. I don't even know really? how you infiltrate hard sciences with ideology. You can if you try hard enough, though. Um, I think it also turned into such a money-making machine that the quality of the professors in these universities has gone downhill compared to like a professor you'd get in the 80s or 90s. Is tuition you know? going down? Oh my gosh, no. No, no. Tu tu tuition has gone way up. The number of HR that's hired has gone way up. So that, that's basically who they're hiring in universities, is the HR departments are massive. Number of students hasn't really changed. Tuition skyrocketed. Number of HR people have skyrocketed. So this is It's like the DMV. Is, so the, the HR department, would they be handling like children that, you know, kids that were in college or that were not had needed um you know, mental like health day or I don't like even know like I don't know what HR does other than what my dad has told me, which is just bother professors, <laughs> which was, that was his explanation in like 2012. He's like, ah, oh, these damn <laughs> HR people get in the way of everything. Um, but you can't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Peterson. Yeah. But that kind of thing, like monitoring what's being taught. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's how, I mean, this is how, um, this is how the narrative could change is that you teach the HR department what's allowed, what's not allowed, and then they go and try and enforce that on the, on the, on the professors, the teachers. Yeah, if you can get into that, like into the, I don't, I don't think you can help that. Like I think it's so far gone that unless there's a huge societal pushback, which I think there is against like this woke ideology, which I think, I mean, compared to 20, 2019 and 2020, I think maybe 2019 was like peak, you can't go against the woke culture or you're, you know, some deplorable something. You're racist. Yeah, racist or homophobic, transphobic, you know, like anything, but mm -hmm. science denier, who knows what, right? I think 2019 was probably the worst year. 2020 was really bad with COVID. I feel like 2024 is better. What do you think? I think things are going in the right direction. I think, I, I mean, yeah, I think that's a good point. I think that people are, there's a bigger movement happening for truth and rational, logical things happening. It's also getting so crazy the other direction too. And I think that's actually helping. Yeah, like things yeah. like banning voter oh, ID true. ends up getting people to just go, wait, what? Yeah. Like it had to get so bad for people to, because there's like, um, there's like this zone that you can get into with anything, a relationship, a job, where it's like not bad enough, not good enough, where nothing really changes. But as soon as things end up getting really bad, there ends up, and because the, the universe is all about balance. It's like a, it's a natural law of balance. And so I think there's so many wild things going on. No, I mean, that's very true. You know, you can watch the Olympics and see like, mm -hmm. you know, a, it's a man with a beard but dressed as a woman and like there's like a you know they're mocking the last supper yeah. and there's someone with shorts and his balls hanging out the side yeah like these things are <laughs> wild i i completely agree that things got to a point where where everybody was like okay that's too much yeah but, but it's amazing how far things had to go for people to be like well, that's too much. Really? really? You couldn't see that four years before? I mean, I think this was COVID. I mean, with yeah, the vaccine. COVID like, helped. Like, it, it helped so because you're, it they're helped. like, yeah. all right, we're going we're gonna to go for it here. Yeah. And I don't know what all the agendas are. But anyway, they pushed it and many, many people bought in. And I think that now that they've kind of had to run it back and there's been so many admissions made about how, uh, how much making up along the way and untruth and 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 and, and damage was caught the six foot rule that, that was Fauci everywhere made up. oh sorry i made it up do you know how annoying that was <laughs> that's the worst 
<laughs> masks everywhere. Masks in a restaurant um, when you're standing, but not when you're sitting eating. Oh yeah, that or was good. Or in an airplane that if you're eating. One. My dad, my dad's just such a, he's such a gem. He's like, I just get popcorn. He's like, I just get popcorn for the flight, and I just eat them one kernel at a time. So, but it's like, just to me, this is where it was like, this is nonsensical. And I just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least follow logic. Like, if there's an infectious disease that's killing people that you can easily get, then why aren't we treating it? Like, like choose one way. Yeah. I agree. That bothered me, too. Yeah. And I think it did swing enough. Yeah. I think it has swung enough. Do you think it will go back? Do you think that there'll be a golden era? Do you think that there'll be, do you think that we'll calm back down again and things will get better and people will be more rational and less victimized and, you know? I, you know what, I do actually. Um, I don't know if that's just what I've been seeing online or the reaction to my dad's political stance or my political stance that I've seen like, People are much friendlier, you know, than they were, so, which makes me think that there's probably a swing back to normalcy. I mm -hmm. think the election, you know, could change could change that potentially, but I don't, and I don't know if this is like controversial to more conservative people. I hope Trump gets in, like I really do. I really hope that happens. Do I have faith that it'll happen? Not really, because I don't trust American gut. The, like, I don't trust anything here. But I really hope that happens. However, if it doesn't, I still think there's a big enough societal push to bring things a little bit closer to the middle that I don't think will keep going off in one direction. Because regardless of who's, and maybe that's like wishful optimism on my point, but I think regardless of who's in power, you know, they still want to make the people happy. And I think society is kind of tired of the woke nonsense, a huge portion of the society. Even if they're liberal people that have more liberal values, I think they're still gonna push whoever's in power a little bit more back back to the center, if it's Kamala, back to the center. That would, but I might be being optimistic. No, I, I mean, I don't think the movements are gonna go away. I think the fear would be wrapped around policy, laws, like imagine if, the borders were just completely Oh my open, God, well that's right? a I mean concern. like imagine, imagine if that happens and then cities will, are infiltrated with, you know, with people that aren't citizens, they might live different. No, they, I, well, and you can see that happen, like. And that's already I, I happening, know, so I right? Am, yeah, and, it's happening and, in the or UK. Or like no voter ID now needed. And what, what happens if the laws and things like that just keep changing and then it ends up being so far gone that you know, what, 21 million illegal London. immigrants? There's, what if there's 100 million? And then all of a sudden you go, it's just not America anymore. Like, this isn't at least how it used to be. And I mean, that's definitely I mean, that's, also a direction we could be going in. Yeah. I don't I think, think like, it's going to go away. For but sure. I, but I, I wonder what would happen. And now Elon really needs to get us to Mars. <laughs> we'll just leave. Forget America. Mars. I don't know if I feel you, like he'll but do like it. the government efficiencies role that he would he'll be taking if That'd Trump gets he's elected. Gonna, he's gonna do like Twitter to the government. I mean, can you imagine if eighty percent of the government was fired? He'd probably run a lot faster. Well, any big company, you realize that, right? Like you've been running your dad's companies and you can move nimble, right? But mm -hmm. then you go and you work with somebody that's a corporate. big corporation and one question can take a month to yeah, answer yeah. by the time it gets from the person to, you know, C-level to vice president to head of marketing or whatever the job was that needed to be done. Yeah. It takes a really long time when there's a lot of people. It takes a really long time when there's a lot of people. I learned it's that too to with sponsors. Sponsors oh, and racing bet. and companies and like things just, I mean, actually we're here at PXG um, Studios, um, Bob Parsons with GoDaddy. The reason why that company blew up so fast and he was in charge, he was making the calls. He was, it was like one and done with him. Like he didn't have, there wasn't a whole yeah. big bunch of questions and boards and people and levels. He just answered the question. So companies can grow really fast as long as someone's willing to be in charge. Yeah, agreed. I've learned that throughout the years too. Traveling is I like been to place Dubai for instance. You, the the speed at which they get things done 
is mm. incredible compared to in the U.S. Oh, wow. Like for, for the average conversation, it's all, oh, you want to manufacture this? Okay, I know a guy, <laughs> right? There's just, there's no red tape. I had wow. the same experience. Serbia, there was no red tape. Not that there aren't downsides, for sure, compared to America. Yeah. I'm not saying that's better. I'm just saying right. the amount of red tape, I, I don't think they've had enough time to create the amount of red tape that there is in America. We were talking to people who have a university in Uzbekistan, and it's the same thing. It's like, oh, you want to, you know, partner together for courses? Sure. It's like, don't we have to do something? No, we just decide what we want to do. And it makes more sense than what we're doing here. Like for instance, so we've been trying to pursue accreditation for Peterson Academy courses, which basically means our ability to transfer credits or something like that. And it's, it would be nice to have, but our main goal is educating people regardless of the accreditation. So it's kind of a nice to have, but it's not fundamental to the business. The way they determine whether or not a course can be accredited is purely dependent on class hours. It's not dependent on what you learn. So I just found this oh, wow. out, it's shocking, yeah. So if you have an intro to psych course, <laughs> there's actually no board that goes, what did you learn in that intro to psych course? They go, what were, how long did you spend on assignments and how many in-class hours were there? I was like, what if our students can learn the same things they're taught in university in a third of the time because the professor's really good? Oh, we're not really sure how to deal with that. Well, can't we just test the students to see if the outcome's the same? No, we don't do that. It's like, okay, well, that's archaic. Like, well, I'm not going Michaela, back to that you know, model. It doesn't fit the Rockefeller make them into yeah. employees format that was originated back in, what, probably the 40s or 50s? Yeah. Where the Rockefellers came in and made, I mean, I love those analogies of, like, prison bus, school bus. Oh, they're right? awful. Right, like, prison hall cafeteria, school cafeteria. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, it's a little like prison. Yeah. And it's all that. made to make you not think. I mean, that's the thing about Peterson Academy I love too, is how diverse the, the how you can make it so diverse for what you teach people. What Because the, they can go into whatever they want and get become experts and dive way deep into it instead of being told by school, look, unless it fits in this box, we don't consider you smart. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, which I think is super cool too, because school, I think, can damage a lot of kids at a young age um, based on either how they want to learn, what they want to learn, the way they want to learn it. Like all of that can very much, and what they're told makes them smart um, or considered smart. I think that uh, yeah. we, we can usher in a new era where there's so many kinds of intelligence now and something like Peterson Academy can be nimble enough to provide that and mm -hmm. have the diversity within the platform to do that. And that maybe someday, it's not accredited to a degree. It is a Peterson degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the plan. We're like, we're, we're going to do that. We're going to do that regardless. Start over. There's a saying, I can't remember who said it, but it's like, instead of trying to fix an old system, just build a new oh, one. Oh, well, exactly. Well, and we like, we decided that from the get beginning. Oh, really? It's like, we're not going to change our courses so they fit into an archaic system that's failing. Like, there's a reason people need a platform like this, and it's because 99% of the professors are extremely political in universities. None of the courses are good. The degree is too expensive. What you learn doesn't apply to your job. Like corporations are looking at degrees less and less compared to experience. It's just, I don't know how, and the fees are astronomical. Unbelievable. Uh, astronomical. And even I know Harvard had a huge loss this year in funding because people are annoyed at them because of what they're teaching and all the, protests oh, yeah. and everything. So it's like, why would we mold anything to that system when we can find the best people to teach really fascinating courses that are just gonna yeah. improve people's lives? Yeah. And I think mo like mostly our goal is for people who are intellectual and they're working from home or they're a mom or they're a student and they like want something more intellectual, here's a place you can go where you can feed that craving, talk to other people who are interested in pursuing that kind of thing. And mostly for people who are interested in being educated to increase their sophistication, like open the doors of opportunity that come with being more verbally fluent, all of that, you know, and, and then and then go to a trade school or get your coding degree or do something that gives you experience. And then you have the sophistication 
because you want to read great books and you want to be able to have conversations about historical people and not sound like a moron. Like you want that kind of background, but get some experience with, for a job you want. And I'm, our plan is to give out people diplomas. So we'll be able to attach that to yeah. their CV and say, hey, this person has done all these courses. Yeah. These are the kind of things they've learned in this courses. They've read all these great books. This is how they've scored on the quizzes, which people don't have to do, but there's optional quizzes. This is how they've scored. And I think any employer, and we're connecting with employers now that are interested in these people, Fantastic. but any employer would be like, oh, they have that kind of education. And then maybe they have some experience. Like that's way more beneficial than I have a liberal arts degree and I'm resentful and hate America. I went to business school. I went to school yeah. for business, right? Yeah. Or like cool. finance or whatever. Imagine if somebody wanted to be a psychologist and they had gone through all of your dad's courses and, yeah. and others that are great psychologists as well and specialize in certain areas like narcissism or something like that. Like imagine- We are putting out a course on narcissism by oh, Keith yeah. Campbell at the end of the month. It's I mean, good. These are the things that if you're going into a, if you're going into a profession and you got to learn from the best of the best, or what if yeah. you're going in and you want to learn about business and you're like, I took the I, Tony Robbins course on yeah. business and the Peterson Academy and like name the courses that you do and learn from brilliant, brilliant people. And I mean, I, I just, I truly, I, I believe in it. How much, how much do you guys think that you sh it should cost to get a, get a degree of some, Maybe that's not the right word. Degree, fine, we can use that word. But how much should it cost for you to become qualified to then go into a profession? I suppose it depends on the profession. So Peterson Academy sure. is $500 a year. You can pay that monthly, but it's a year contract. Um, 500 for the year or 500 a month? 500 for the year. Okay. Yeah. And that was basically as we were like, well, let's make it as cheap as possible. So Just that's because where there's it's a funny. portal. There'll be options for them to watch different courses. Yeah, you you log in. Is you everything can available or a portion? Everything. Everything's available yeah, for five hundred dollars for the year. Yeah. Oh well, I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can watch all the courses. There's a social media platform. It's like wow. You can message people. Oh really? Communicate. So there's like they an internal on portal videos. as well. Yeah, yeah. It's wow. a whole ecosystem. It's great, and we wanted to make it as affordable as we could make it and still build it because we don't have outside funding like it's just us do you pay the people that create content for you we do okay yeah and they've been thrilled to do it great professors don't get paid very much from universities really really good with professors yeah sure, it is not terrible I, I, was I'm like, not, I am not it, surprised it, yeah I was a bit surprised I think growing <laughs> up with my dad I was like professor is like that's like the best thing you can become. It takes more school than, I have a cousin, one of my cousins married a guy who is a professor and he was, he, I swear, he went to school for 10 years at least. Yeah, yeah. Like it took, it's or more, uh, to get his, to become a professor, which is longer than a doctor. Yeah, it's crazy. And you don't get paid that well. No, you don't get paid well at all. And so it costs we, we a can lot actually, of money and puts you in debt. We can actually pay people well. And it's not very much work for them because it's like, okay, what, what's the course that you think is most valuable for people? And you can teach it however you want to teach it. We're like, we, we're not in an HR department. <laughs> like you don't have to use certain words or like make this a certain way. Just yeah. teach it how you would want to teach it in a way that you would think would benefit people the most. And then here's money. And people have been super happy about it. I think it's fun too because you get to go to a studio and like, get made up and then you have a live audience and the courses are the, the people we have on the platform so far everybody has been amazing we have a number of psychologists we have john verveik he's been great stephen hicks like i said keith campbell mm -hmm. is is great we've got different levels too we're kind of starting with intro courses but we have a few fourth level courses like verveik is is a tricky course and we're putting out one from dad on maps of meaning that's gonna be a tricky course. But we're pretty much going in order, so if you don't have an educational background, you can still hop right in and, and start. Hmm. Yeah, so it's for anybody. That's and it was just so insulting, it was so irritating to go to, I went to a university in Canada called Concordia, and it was so insulting. I had this dream of going to university, like I was going to Hogwarts. Like that's what I expected when I went off to university from the way my dad talked about it. It was like, I'm going to Hogwarts. And I went to like this moldy, dungeon in Montreal kind and of my, it was so bad and I had to go 30 minutes outside Probably of there Montreal. was more mold there for you too uh, yeah 
Yeah. Oh yeah, it's been throughout my whole life. Exactly. But I had to go 30 minutes outside the city to get to the science classes because they like shuttled all the science students what? outside the city. It's not a campus? There's a campus downtown and a campus in, I can't remember, but it's 30 minutes like away from Montreal. Uh, and it was just so depressing. I was like, and then my psych professor, my intro to psych professor told me rats weren't social creatures because they lived in cages. And he wasn't joking. It'd be like saying like a bird can't fly because it's in a cage. Yeah, it was really like, bad. No, birds and can't fly. Have you seen it? They're yeah, in the cage. Yeah. <laughs> and it was bad enough that I remember turning to the person next to me being like, did he just say that? And she was like, yeah. I was like, this is crazy. So I didn't go back to that psych class. But I think the irritation of that and then seeing what kind of students are also being produced by good universities, which is like this woke mess of a human that feels sorry for themselves, and then they're $300,000 in debt. I was like, do you just ruined that person and made them pay you? That's a scam. Like you can learn so many things on YouTube and on the, we have the internet now. You can get educated from the internet. Exactly. Right? So it's like, well, we have the opportunity to film these professors or really smart it. people. It's really well, like, it's entertaining enough for somebody who has ADD. I was like, you're actually gonna like the lecture. I think I've heard because they have the, cheap. you have the professor, but then essentially there's like a green screen behind that you keep putting like different kinds yeah, of. Yeah, they, they have slides. So yeah. if they have anything on their slide, that goes up behind them or we have animations that go up behind them. Right. And it was for, like, I can't even watch podcasts. I don't know what's wrong with podcasts me. Podcasts are a little boring to watch. Dude, I can't do it. I, I also have a trouble with, I don't know if there's something wrong with me. I have trouble with audio. So I like, I'll read a whole transcript of a podcast, just like fine. And it's fast. That's easy, but I can't do the audio and the visuals kind of bore me. So it was good trying to edit these lectures being like, okay, nope, losing focus. And oh. it wasn't, and it was a me thing. It wasn't because <laughs> the professors aren't interesting. Like I'm watching Verveke or dad. Like it's not like they're not super engaging. It was like graphic now. Like, <laughs> just yeah. like a pop, like yeah. stay focused. You were the perfect person to uh, yeah. fine tune I it. I don't know what that brain problem is, but yeah. I yeah. have it. What do you think has made, given you the skill set to be so determined, successful, confident? I mean, I know we've you talked about health and how, you know, certain medications throughout your life kind of gave you some different personality traits. Um, <laughs> I mean, we didn't even talk about birth control. That's another one. Yep. We'll pick the wrong people because we're on it, um, uh, which they never teach you about any of that or mm -hmm. the fact that you're not actually having a period. Anyway, it's for a whole other discussion. <laughs> we're definitely not going down that route. Um, but you know, what what has given you the ability to be so determined, so such a hard worker, liking work, having, you know, r being able to function in the world? Like this is the question, right? To be able to be functioning in the world and be ambitious. I think having arthritis as a kid really helped. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, like my parents, obviously I was raised by my parents who were wonderful. And my dad told me things like, you can never use your illness as an excuse. You know, I was taught the value of working hard as a young person, but I was also extremely sick. And I wasn't just sick physically, and I was very sick physically, like hip and ankle replaced at 17, couldn't walk for multiple years in between that, very sick physically and very sick mentally. So I also learned not to trust what I was thinking if it was illogical. If I'd be like, that doesn't, you know, I can feel that emotion, but like, that's not logical. So I learned how to kind of separate myself from crazy thoughts I was having. Hmm. Once I got healthy and I stopped being like disabled and insane, I was like, oh, Life is easy. Like life is impossible when you can't get out of bed and you're in pain and you're on eight medications and you can't trust what you're thinking. Life is hard then. And you still have to get out of bed and feed yourself and go to school and have friends and pretend everything's okay. I did that, you know, for the first 20 years of my life. And then when I got healthy, I was like, oh, everything's easy. Like I used to have trouble bowling at my brother's birthday party because my thumb would get stuck in it because my thumb was swollen. So I didn't like bowling. I didn't like camping because it hurt my shoulders to lie on the ground. Like I didn't like to do anything because everything hurt. I went bowling after my arthritis went away and I was like, I'm really good at bowling because I bowled with a handicap for like 15 years. I was like, oh, no wonder people enjoy this. This is great. <laughs> so like I think a lot of the worth the work ethic and the enjoyment I get from doing work 
is from being like hyper stressed and hyper sick my entire life and then it just going away when I got healthy and was like, okay, nothing is as hard as being chronically ill. So people like, I have, I've had questions that are like, is podcasting hard? Or is the, you know, are certain business things hard? No, being chronically ill is hard. You know, watching somebody you love with a chronic illness, that's hard. Yeah. Having a family member like die or on the yeah. verge of death, that's hard. When your mom was very sick, your dad was very sick. Like that was hard. That was like horribly hard. But like doing business stuff isn't hard. That's fun. So you got perspective early. Yeah, serious perspective. Do you perspective. feel like it gave you like, um, do you feel gratitude is part of that? Is that kind of how you feel? Is that it's I wouldn't perspective? change it. Gratitude is that what you feel now though? You're like, oh no, I love this. Like I'm, I love being healthy. I'm so grateful that I can do all these things because gratitude is a super powerful emotion. I know people talk about that and throw that around like, have an attitude of gratitude, but it's wild yeah, how it effective is. it can be to just sort of shift your perspective like that. I think my perspective, I don't know if I shifted it or if it just shifted. I was mad for a number of years when I got healthy first. I was angry at the medical system and being like, this is what I was missing out on. Like how many people are stuck in the situation I was stuck in and don't know that they can fix themselves. So I was really angry for a number of years. Then that was probably when I was in psych med withdrawal, which was a whole other thing. Um, then yeah, grateful for sure. Like I still have days where like I have my ankle replaced and it kind of hurts just in general, just a little bit, mm -hmm. but like that's annoying because there's nothing I can do to fix it. It's like as fixed as it can be. So those kind of things still aggravate me a little bit, but I honestly don't know if I would, I don't think I would work or try to accomplish as much as I am trying to accomplish. I don't think I would have the faith in myself without having to go through the things I went through and overcome those. So I don't even know how to put a value on that. You know, you know the, hard, the harder it, whatever you deal with, the harder it is, the more capable you know you are afterwards. Right. And that's like invaluable for that's people. Right. It's like, oh, I can get through the next stressful thing. This isn't as stressful as that last thing I went through and I handled that. Yeah, well, the old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 100%. You mentioned faith, is that a part? Oh my gosh, yeah, that's I more I know that recent. religion has come on much more that's, recently. That's much more recently. That's much more recently. That's been huge, that's been huge. Like. How can I describe that? I've always been a, you know, I'm not doing good enough. I'm not doing good enough. I could do better. I could do better. I could yeah. do better type of person. I, know. I have the disease too. Yeah. Which comes with a lot of benefits because you end up yeah. pushing yourself way more than a reasonable push person would push themselves. But um, what faith has helped me do, which has been very helpful, is when I do get stressed or or uh, encounter stressful things. I'm not talking about work, generally speaking, but I mean, it could be like low level stress like work, but like stressful things, I don't feel like the only option is for me to figure out what to do. Like whenever I had a problem before, I'd be like, okay, I know there's a way out of it. I know I'm capable of doing it. I just had to figure out the way out of this. Hmm. And it would encompass me. And I would generally figure my way out of it, but it hurt and it was hard. Um, and now I realize, depending on the problem, I don't need to put that amount of effort in, you know, I don't, f I feel like it's going to be okay. Do like God's got for me. Help? I mean, is this oh, where yeah. prayer? Please. Oh yeah, definitely. Ask for help. Ask for patience. Ask for stronger faith to like help encourage me to believe things will be okay. Patience a lot. <laughs> And then, yeah. you know, and then usually like, usually I also believe that if I'm going through something difficult, it's because there's something better on the other side. So I have that faith in that too. And, but I actually had that before I got saved or became a Christian. Hmm. Like I, I had the belief that like, if I was going through something bad, there was something better on the outside once I went through a bad things a number of times. <laughs> um, but recently I think it's just been, yeah, I think it's hard to be a human and not have, s not Ha, not pray when things are hard. Yeah. Life is hard. Yeah. No one has a like. 
It helps I, lift some of that burden, right? It helps someone oh, lift yeah. the weight. It's like less that, weight. That too. And, and oh yeah, unburden myself. Like I can't handle, th I'm also fine now with saying, and I didn't used to be fine with saying this, but like, I can't tolerate this. Like, mm. please take, take the burdens from me. <laughs> like it's too much for me. Mm. And I think it, that's totally reasonable. Like people nowadays are exposed to so much. You have like families, you're working, you're exposed to the news internationally. There's like COVID, everything's a scam. Like there's yeah. a lot of chaos yeah. going on. <laughs> it's not that surprising that people are kind of anxious. And so yeah. saying like, yeah, I can't handle this. But like, yeah, of course you can't handle it. Nobody can handle it. So That's yeah, good. asking for burden, relief, patience, knowing things are gonna be okay. And I'm just calmer, like much calmer. Yeah. Less existential angst, yeah. like no existential angst, maybe a little bit on some days and then I can pray about it, but. Well, let's hope that, um, I mean, the Republican party is pretty, pretty much on the religious side. I don't know if you saw those recent, that recent clip from Kamala at a, at a debate or at a, uh, at a, at a town hall or something like that that she was doing <laughs> and somebody screamed out like, Jesus is Lord. And I mean, we're assuming that this is all accurate in the way that they've depicted it. But she replies with, I think you're at the wrong, I think you're in the wrong room. Yeah, I, I think, think you're, you're at the, the wrong, wrong rally. I think you're at the wrong rally. That You're looking at the one, da you should go to the one smaller down the street. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's... that's did, you, did, that, did you watch that? So I watched that on X and I was like, is that what happened? Look, See, I take everything with a grain it, that's of salt. Ins that, that's seems like, that doesn't even, that's not a good PR move, period. Forget about religion, whether or not you believe that. But like, you don't want to do that. That's just dumb. How do you, why would you alienate anyone? In yeah. fact, let's just yeah. back it up, back it up. Anything that anyone said in that audience that they're, that's there standing, and even if they're not cheering for you, but they're a face in the crowd and they're filling the room, even if they're testing you, whatever they said, because we don't, we don't always know exactly what happened. But why in the world would she say something like that to anyone? You're in the wrong, you're in the wrong room. Like you should, you're, you're at the wrong rally. Yeah, it like, ha it'd have to be something. Anything. She should never say it no matter what anyone said. No matter what. Just ignore them. Th this is what you've developed over time. This is what I've developed over time. Thick skin. You know how many times people say horrible things about me, to me, or write them? <laughs> they do the same thing for you, right? Yeah. You've seen this throughout your whole life with your dad, especially as all of that came on when he was teaching in Toronto. Like, you, like people say horrible things and you know what you say? Nothing. And you move on. Yeah. It's like I, there was another little clip that, it was a Charlie Kirk clip, and it was some kid that walked up, and you know, he comes up to the microphone, all those kids in colleges, and um, he said, Charlie, what drugs are you gonna do if Donald Trump doesn't get elected? And basically his response was like, none, I'm, I'm gonna go to work the next day. That's what I'm gonna do. You might be gonna, you may do some drugs and do that with your life if it doesn't go the way you want, but I'm gonna go to work the next day. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of, country we want to live in. Yeah, yeah. Right. Agreed. Well, you're doing a great job. Thank you. So are you. Congratulations <laughs> on the recent like tour. That was wild. <laughs> okay, two was like, this up. is at, off, awesome. Do you have two more? How many more? I don't know. I, they come up like, like, oh, what are you doing on Thursday? And you're like, um, <laughs> apparently rearranging my schedule. <laughs> now's that's, the time. That's so funny. Now's I feel like time. that's just a glimpse into like, what politics is like. Probably, very, very Cause. nimble. But look, I, I got a feeling that if it goes in the direction that we want it to go, um, that you'll be involved too, because there's just, the brilliant minds are accumulating and you're one of them, so. Thank you, that would be fun. <laughs> Cheers, here's to that. You're in the right room. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you wanna hear more, please click on the subscribe button.